Please welcome Ginger to the S4 main stage. So good afternoon, and I'm going to start by saying, if you couldn't tell by the introduction, I have the best job in the world. I get to play with a lot of different research topics, all focused on critical infrastructure. And today, I'm going to mix up a few of those and ask you to invite the chaos monkey to help you with incident response resilience. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the DARPA Radix program. And I'll say this at the end again. You can see it on the third floor. Come and get a demo of the tools. I'm going to tell you a little bit about a company, Netflix, um, that when their infrastructure got too complicated for them to control using traditional tools, they actually embraced their greatest fears. I'm going to talk about test effect payloads, which the DARPA Radix program uses to measure the performance of the researchers developing tools for the program. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about how you can develop a strategy based on some of the Netflix success for using this DARPA technology in your own infrastructure. So this starts for me with the Radix program. This is a DARPA program focused on rapid attack detection, isolation, and characterization systems. So researchers involved in this DARPA program are developing tools not to help us keep attackers away from our systems, but to help us once they've come in to find out what's happening, to isolate those systems from further attack, and then characterize what's happening so that it can be remediated. Um, in order to have an operational platform to focus on for the program, we've chosen a cyber-affected Black Start recovery. So if you can imagine a difficulty that led you to need to perform a Black Start recovery of your power systems complicated with a cyber attack, that's what we have at Radix. And to make it more real for the performers, instead of using simulated systems or kind of pretend environments, we actually take them out into the field. We have a real power infrastructure set up that they install their tools on, that bad things happen to, and that utilities aid, aided by these tools actually remediate over the course of a week. So that's Radix in a nutshell. What I want you to understand is the exercise starts with a live, ongoing cyber attack. Again, the perimeter defense model has failed. The adversary is in our systems. They own our assets, and any action that we take to remediate the system, they can counter or even use that action to make things worse. So part of what we are teaching our performers and the utilities who participate is that reflashing and restoration aren't viable solutions for a true, deeply skilled attack on critical infrastructure. That operating in manual mode, although it might help us in specific situations for long-term restoration of the grid, is also not viable. It might work well for short terms in very urban areas, but in very distributed areas, manual mode is very hard to affect and very costly to continue. Um, so for DARPA Radix, the defenders, instead of trying to, again to keep the attackers out, they're detecting the attackers' tools and techniques and reclaiming territory that they can then defend so that the grid can restart. And so I've been on these exercises for several years. And each time, I started thinking about the utilities who participate and what they learn from this experience and how that changes, how they look at their own infrastructure systems. And for several of them, there is a moment when they walk into one of the substations and a breaker operates with no human there and no HMI control, no one in the control center executed a command, and it's clearly a cyber attack. And that utility typically says, this is one of my worst fears, that I'm standing here, I, I own this power system, but I cannot control it. So that got me thinking about what does a company do with their cyber worst fears? And that led me to Netflix, which is probably a far cry from power infrastructure, but stay with me, I'll make it relevant. Um, if you remember in the beginning 
of 1997, Netflix was a company that was an alternative to Blockbuster. You could turn on your web browser, you could select movies, and they would send them to you in the mail. Eventually, as they matured, they streamed movies to clients, um, sending them directly to a terminal. At first, there were very few interfaces that you could get Netflix movies on, but in time, as the demand grew, the product grew. And eventually, this company that had defined success around owning their own compute infrastructure, owning that customer relationship from soup to nuts, from the website where you ordered things, to having the IP agreements that got them the movies and able to ship them out, to even having special agreements with the postal service about what happened with the red envelope. They had to take that control away because they could not grow at the scale they needed to and keep it. And they had to put their compute, which was the corner of their business, in someone else's hands. So what happens to a company that has to give the family jewels away? Well, the first thing that happens when your infrastructure gets this complicated is you start having real conversations about consequences that you are afraid of, your real worst fears and worst dynamics. Um, and many companies, when you talk about your worst fear, you start talking about ways to prevent them. But Netflix didn't stop there. They started talking about ways to actually invite their worst fears, to bring them about so that they could gain the muscle tone from learning how to deal with that fear and moving forward. They created what is affectionately called the Simeon Army, a collection of monkeys, and, and they're monkeys for a reason. The first one they created was the Chaos Monkey. The chaos monkey in the Netflix architecture would randomly kill a session. Because when the developers talk to each other, when the service owners talk to each other, that was the first worst fear. When we turn our infrastructure over and it is operating in the cloud and we can't see it anymore and we can't touch it anymore, how can we tell when a customer's experience suddenly stops? And what do we do about that? That's frightening, that's challenging. So instead of trying to prevent it, they developed an application that would, running on their systems regularly, kill sessions. Just out of the blue, bang, bang, bang. And at first, that was a really difficult situation for their incident response team to detect and to, re to respond to, and maybe manually restart that customer session or get things going again. But eventually, they developed applications so that when the chaos monkey killed a session, another was spawned and the customer noticed no interruption. And they could actually use that event to collect data on how well they performed and how resilient they were. So that was the first one, and it was very successful. And their developers got better because they knew every day this bad thing would happen. They weren't saving the crisis for some indelicate future, unpredictable, some Thursday off in the corner. They weren't just doing tabletops and playing with the idea. They knew every day at some random interval, sessions would drop that the system would have to deal with. So the next greatest fear that they took on, because they had been successful in this, was what if they lost an entire data center? What if a regional Amazon web center lost power or failed to deliver? They called that the chaos gorilla. And again, at first, once they let that loose on their systems, they had some service interruptions. But they knew if they dealt with that, with their great customer service, they would then develop the tools that they could use to prevent it from being a problem again. Not to make the problem go away, not to use contractual methods to make Amazon be more responsive. They could actually invite it to happen every day of the week and it wouldn't bother them anymore. They had become immune to the thing that they feared. And I've got a list here of the other monkeys that they created, but you can see they took a regular approach towards what are our little problems, what are our fears, what do we wish wouldn't happen, and they started developing tools that would cause this to happen and then cause them to get better and fix it. 
So they developed an engineering methodology to describe what they were doing called chaos engineering. And chaos engineering has some principles that are different from traditional testing. The first is you're inside of business operations. Netflix ran this on real customer connected systems. And if there are asset owners out there, I recognize that's a hard thing to think about. Um, in normal testing, you're outside of business operations. You are in a safe system. Um, Chaos Monkey is pseudo-random. There's not a test script that we are going through. Instead, we have given the, the monkey a set of things that it can do, and it wanders and starts pulling connections or doing whatever it's doing on a random basis so that we can't predict it and then use human means to get beyond it. For chaos engineering, we deal with failure modes. And we're not trying to prevent them, we're trying to invite them. In regular testing, instead, we would look at requirements. The system shall this, the system shall be up this many hours a day. And we're trying to test whether we've got what we need to make that requirement happen. In a chaos engineering environment, we're looking at experiments, not tests. Tests are steps that we go through where we are verifying facts at each point in the way. And we expect to end up with results. With a chaos environment, we really don't know what's going to happen the first time that we conduct an experiment. But we know we're going to learn from it. And we know we'll have a chance to do another experiment and move the idea forward. The idea for chaos engineering is that we embrace resilience and build on that where with testing, we would be eliminating point weaknesses. So I think you get my point about these differences. Now I want to take you back to Radix, this rapid attack detection, isolation, and characterization systems program. I've given you a map to look at that is the real environment upon which these exercises are conducted. And you see a little bit of Long Island, and then you see a lot of Plum Island. This is a very isolated place um, out off of the coast of Long Island. The teams that have to respond to power events during our exercises, they actually take a ferry ride to get them onto the island so that they can do that work. You'll see that we have here two utilities shown, Utility A and Utility B, um, which each have a staff. And they each have critical loads and critical services that they are responsible for maintaining. And often, the power situation at each utility is different. So we are trying to make this very realistic for both the performers and the utilities to help them. And the goal, again, is to make the research real and relevant and make the tools work for you. So as I describe that to you, I hope to you it sounded a lot like the chaos engineering principles that I talked about. We are running a real black start process on real equipment. Again, not simulated systems, not things that we are uh, inventing, and not tabletop. Um, our scenarios are slightly scripted, but for the performers, I will tell you, they seem very random to them. Um, we are playing with failure modes. We are emulating a regional power outage over an extended period, more than a week. And usually, the, the scenario for performers begins with the fact that the power outage started many weeks before. So their tools are even more critically called upon. Um, these are experiments. This is all a research effort. And even the utilities participating in Radix have walked away learning things that they didn't expect. Um, we are enhancing resilience because we are looking at this black start recovery for which, before Radix really focused on it, the impact of a cyber attack to black start hadn't really been characterized. And the kinds of issues that one might run into restoring a grid that has been under cyber attack through black start had not been characterized. Finally, we have systems that we have compromised. And we are forcing both the utilities and the researchers to embrace that failure and to understand how they can still accomplish the goals and move beyond it. So how do we do that? Well, we do that by creating test effect payloads. Test effect payloads are small programs, misconfigurations, um, sometimes scripted effects. They are highly coupled to the systems that they are on. Because we want this to be something observable, 
something that will cause a challenge for the researchers, again, to detect, to isolate, or to characterize so that they can prove that their tools work. For us, these TEPs are like an obstacle course. They force the researchers to push themselves a little bit and move past their assumptions and actually try out the tools that they've created with something real in a real environment. Um, with our TEPs, we try to avoid damage to devices. You don't learn quite as much if you blow something up as you do if you can keep it running and continue the learning going. And we try to understand what the consequences of each of these effects will be to the systems, to the utilities, and to the performer tools as we put them in place. I want to say for everybody here, TEPs are not vulnerabilities. We have presumptive access to these systems. In other words, the people creating these effects can log into the system and make it happen. They can use the capabilities that are offered by the systems to provide these challenges for the researchers. Um, our TEPs typically do not reflect the entire cyber kill chain. We're not trying to model for our researchers how the performer learned about the systems that the utility had, how they might have initially gotten access, how they might have transacted networks. We might show pieces of this happening so that their tools get a picture of it, but we're not trying to create one cohesive story for them to see. They can re reflect a, com a combination of attack stages, so if more of those kill chain steps happened, we might have a test effect payload that's doing those steps all at once. Again, to give the evidence of something happened, but not to require that the whole thing happen in a staged effect because we only have a week. We have to create enough evidence to be found, but not draw out the story so that it lasts as long as an entire attack. These TEPs are tunable for specific effects and behaviors. One of the nice things about what we've created is that we can make a very small effect. If a tool is, has got a capability that they're pretty sure is mature, but they just want to check that last piece, or we can create something that should be obvious to the researchers that's either an easy win or a way to check the box and say, yes, they can measure this too. Um, and for Radix, we have an automated means by which we can install and remove these test effect payloads. Um, that did require the development of some additional infrastructure on our test bed, but it's paid off in spades. So now we know when there is a TEP on the system, what it might be doing, and if we need to, we can pull it back off and have the system back at its normal state. So some examples of TEPs. What if we introduce a new host on the network? What if it sends DNP traffic to other hosts and attempts telnet sessions to other hosts, but it's not one that is in the device inventory for the utility? Can the researchers discover that? What do their tools say, and what do they help the utilities do as a result of finding this new host? What if I have can get in the stream of HMI data and not change what's happening out on the field devices, but have the HMI reflect different data than what is actually taking place. Um, can I use structured text to do that? One example, I might change the voltage that's reported to an HMI in hopes that the operator will take an action that will then subvert the system. Um, in this case, if we had a TEP like that, it would not affect the real data, just the HMI. Another one might be a misconfiguration on a relay so that for the relay, it will trigger an overcurrent the minute we power it up, no matter what we give it. Those are examples of TEPs, and each of them let the tools, again, discover what's happening, determine if they can isolate that effect, and if they can characterize it and ask the utilities to come and remediate it. So as I thought about these TEPs, and I thought about incident response, this is a great tool for utilities to try to measure whether their incident detection, isolation, and characterization is happening the way that they've planned, the way that they've designed, and the way that they've invested. And so I, I've got some steps here for how you might use this TEP technology for yourselves. Uh, how you might design a TEP campaign to experiment as to whether your system's people and processes work the way that you want them to or where they could be improved. 
And it starts with a technology that Dale mentioned this morning, INL's consequence-based cyber-informed engineering. And step one of that process is, just like Netflix did, define those high-consequence outcomes. What, as an entity, are you most afraid of? What are the things that you really don't want to invite, but you know that if you could learn to deal with them, they would help you greatly? I've given you some examples on the slide, but what you would do is talk about at a range of levels within your company and with a range of technical specialists what truly are those high consequence outcomes or effects that you would worry about. Make sure that you pick the ones that are the most important for your initial design. Then you would identify the systems that would actuate that effect. So what systems are connected to it? What might someone do that would make that happen? And then define the kill chain of what that attack would look like and what observables you could see as it took place. And at that point, you would have a fairly good start on what are those real consequences that you're concerned about. Take that as input and then go through the next stage. Design an experiment. Think about the expected behaviors that those observables would cause within your systems, processes, and people. If an alarm went off, what group would respond? What should they do? How long should it take? What should that response look like? What are you expecting each of the systems that you've incorporated into your incident detection, response, and remediation to do? What actual hard effects are you looking for? And with that, all of it, that's your hypothesis. You have created an experiment where if those effects happened, you have a list of the things that you believe you will see as outcomes. That should be the experiment results that you're hoping for. Then plan the experiment. Now you know what you have to make happen and you know what you expect to see. So you can start putting in some of the complicated effects like how should the timing work? Uh, what are the true details of the expected outcomes that you are looking for? With that, you go slightly deeper. Now you're truly going to plan and construct that experiment. And the first step in this process is what the chaos team called a blast radius analysis. So that's very evocative. What they're really looking for is, as you think about this experiment, one of the most important things, particularly on critical infrastructure systems, is to understand the effect that running this experiment will have. Could you take down a critical system that for this experiment would be even more of a problem for you to deal with? Do you understand how this experiment is going to affect the people who serve it, the systems and the processes involved? And do you have backstops that if things go wrong, you can pull away from this so that you can refine the experiment and run it again? Once you do that, then you can begin to construct those test effect payloads. And again, those can be anything from misconfigurations of a system, they can be script ladder logic on a system that causes certain things to happen. Quite frankly, they can be index cards. Some of you work in environments where your production system is regulated and highly controlled. And so the idea that you would have chaos monkeys running everywhere um, and you would fill out DOE forms saying, gee, I'm sorry, we lost power, but we were doing a chaos monkey experiment, that might not go over with your regulators or your stakeholders. So know that a test effect payload could be an index card that you put on someone's desk and say, this is what you saw, what do you do next? And have them walk through the operations. As you run your experiment, please don't forget, you're collecting data. This is not about pass and fail. This is about how much did I learn about my systems, my processes, and my people from doing this event. Always, Repeat the experiment. It is okay to go again. Part of the success that Netflix had was when their people realized this crazy idea with sessions dropping, with data centers dropping, it wasn't gonna go away. The executives weren't gonna get tired of exercising the system in this way, and this problem wasn't gonna magically solve itself. 
that helped the people develop their own resilience and develop their own tools so that they could make the system respond to these effects favorably over a long period of time. So running a chaos monkey experiment once and getting your data is not enough. You have to get some corporate buy-in and some internal buy-in to run these experiments again and again, because each time you will get slightly different data, each time you will improve your results, and part of the result again is to help people understand that these problems can and do happen, and for them to develop the confidence to deal with them effectively. As you think about your test effect payload campaign, I would encourage you, at least at first, think small, be very exact. Isolate one system or one effect. Think about that chaos monkey that just dropped sessions. Maybe that tight a scenario is the first one you want to perform. See what happens. Look at your experiment. How do the people respond to it? What did you learn as an event? And then go larger. Think about how you will minimize that blast radius. As someone who has participated in lots of exercises, often it's that temp that you didn't plan for that really kills you. Often it's the operator who engages in a behavior that you just didn't think was possible and you didn't prevent that changes the nature of the flow. And granted, you learn more about your, your systems, you learn from that experiment, but it wasn't the learning that you had hoped to. So think about how you will minimize the blast radius of what you do. Remember, and I've tried to be consistent, this experiment process is about tuning people, processes, and tools. All three should be affected by any single chaos monkey experiment. And many of you, again, live in regulated environments. So what I would ask is test as close to production as possible. No matter how good your demo systems are, they will always be some deviation away from production. Even the people who service them, if I'm servicing the demo system, I know it's not real. So the closer I can get my experiment to production, the closer my results are something that I can rely upon. As I talked about a second ago, think about how you would use paper TEPs. Think about the degree to which you can make the experiment real without actually putting the effect on the system. And what could you allow on your system that still falls within your risk ratio? For non-production environments, consider a full kill chain experiment. Again, for our radix processes, we didn't need that, but perhaps that's what you want to do, is go all the way from the very beginning of an attack all the way to the end so that you can understand how your, how your systems respond to it at each step. If you are interested in these ideas and interested in going further, I invite you to come upstairs and see the DARPA exhibit. Up on the third floor, on the mezzanine, we have videos of past exercises. We have our performers. Um, we have our TA1 performer who is all about detection of events on a power system. And can they solve that age-old problem of determining the difference between a, a cyber event and a squirrel? They have the tools that can do that. Uh, our TA2 performer performs isolation. They ensure that the restoration event is on a separate network and well away from the attacker's actions. And finally, our TA3 performer performs characterization. They look at each effect that is happening and try to understand what might be behind it and then offer the utilities advice upon how to fix it. Scattered here, you may find utility asset owners who will reflect back to you that they have attended a Radix event. I would also invite you, please talk to them. Find out what they learned from that. Find out what was important about those events and how it changed how they approached risk planning and risk mitigation within the live systems that they own. For many of them, the stories that they will tell you are going to, be, are going to affect how you think about it. Um, if you are an asset owner and you are interested in participating in a future exercise, the next Radix exercise is in May, and again, talk to the team upstairs, and they can talk to you about how to join in. I'm going to finish by saying, please think about chaos monkey experiments. 
you can have fascinating results and learn about the systems that you protect by doing these small experiments. I will be upstairs on the Radix floor at various times throughout this conference if you have questions or would like to discuss this idea further. I will be there. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a very delightful S4 conference.